Happy day after the election. Possibly fewer emails, fewer recorded phone calls, yes. at least for a couple of days till the next round starts. Uh, reminders as usual, if you've got your phone with you, you might check to see if you either turn it off or put it on buzz. Uh, if you're wearing a tea coil, now is the time to turn it on. Um, if we get to a question and answer session, and I'm not sure whether we will, please wait for the microphone to come to you and then let us know your name. That will be helpful in the room and on the film. And I also want to let you know that new light bulbs were installed and we don't think that they will dim. <laughs> so, okay. I mean, less chance of falling asleep. One way to look at it. So. Um, I'm delighted to introduce our speaker today, our friend on the bucket committee, Jim Arns. Jim is a former professor of military history at Wentworth Academy Junior College, and his topic today is 1918, the path to armistice. Please welcome Jim. Hey, is that too loud, Judy? Okay. Well, I'll put it back in my pocket for a while. I'm going to talk about World War I. I did this a few years ago in six sessions, so you're going to get this casual treatment today. I'm going to talk about, generally, World War I in 1917, 1918, when the United States got roped into this uh, war, and sort of the beginning of our uh, empire stage. Uh, the Allies imposed what they called a distant blockade on Germany in 1914. And a close blockade is where the ships of the blockader sail right up to the uh, entrance to the harbor and uh, prevent anything from going in. And that's not practical anymore because of mines and uh, submarines and long-range guns. But the British had control of the English Channel. And in that uh, control, they uh, controlled from Calais to Andover in that uh, narrow spot, and also in the North Sea between Scapa Flow and the Orkney Islands and the southern Norwegian coast. So they had Germany pretty well uh, 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 locked in, and they used mine barriers for most of this, and they had cruiser control in there, and they intercepted something like 135 ships a week for a total of 12,000 during the whole war. Less than 100 ships made it into Germany during the uh, whole war. And the British declared the entire North Sea and the waters between Iceland and the Norwegian coast a war zone, and any shipping had to check in with the British before they would be cleared into the ports of Europe. And it didn't make people very happy to have the British lording this over them. But uh, German foodstuffs and their imports dropped dramatically during this time. Plus, 1916 was a bad year. The Austrians lost a lot of grain and poor harvests, uh, and they lost uh, nitrate and phosphorus for fertilizer, although a professor by the name of Haber had invented a process of fixing nitrogen to the air, from the air, so that uh, they had no trouble making munitions. And as a result of all of this, the Germans suffered a good deal because of the worldwide drought, and the winter of 1617 was called the turnip winter because 
there were a lot of people that ate turnips, which had previously only been fed to livestock. Later on, they made bread out of sawdust and potato peels. I'm not quite sure what that would taste like, uh, but it would be a sure brush peach anyway. Uh, malnutrition turned into starvation in 1917. There were 20, 250,000 deaths in 1917, and 1918 was uh, 290,000. Children's mortality rate increased up to 50%. So it was effective against uh, the uh, Germans, and it sapped their tolerance for putting up with the war and its horrendous casualties. Uh, the Germans decided something had to be done. They couldn't stand this to happen any longer, and uh, they wouldn't have been able to participate. The German troops actually had some priority for food, and that ran out in 1918 in January. And when the gold great offensive that was started in the spring of 1918, the so-called big push, the uh, German troops were delayed in many cases when they captured Allied rations, and they settled down to eat them on the spot and because they were so hungry and that got the German offensive off the of schedule. It was a tremendous uh, difficult time for them. The French were almost in the same boat as the Germans were. Um, it was about the end of their resources, economic and manpower and morale. And they had to demobilize a half a million men in order to man industry. They couldn't make essential uh, production goals without that much. Uh, the premier of France at that time was Georges Clemenceau. He was an old newspaper editor from years back. Uh, he had been a private uh, physician before that. And he was a promoter of the war of revenge, or revanche, on the Germans because of what the Germans had done to the French, humiliated them in 1890, 1871. Uh, he called for action constantly. Now in Britain, uh, Lord Kitchener was dead. He was lost, lost at sea when the cruiser he was riding on was sunk as he made a trip to Russia around the uh, ocean and the Prime Minister Askeith gave up and he was replaced by David Lloyd George, the fiery Welshman who was uh, head of the uh, Liberal coalition there and in um, their demands to Sir Douglas Haig, the um, Pro the uh, uh, British commander-in-chief, he had to get busy and prosecute the war more intensely. Now, uh, in Russia, in 1917, uh, February or March, depending on which calendar you're using, the revolutions toppled the Tsar, and the provisional government was set up, which will last until uh, uh, October or November, depending on your calendar, and uh, it'll almost take the Russians out of the war when they decide that uh, they can't do anything more. And so, in Germany, the powers that be is Hindenburg and Ludendorff, as well as the general staff, was making all the decisions. The only thing that Kaiser did was uh, patriotic motives. He prevented the Navy from making a death ride at the end of 16 and start of 17 to uh, make one last effort to defeat the English. <coughs> the Navy said that they could, they could uh, sink 600,000 tons of shipping a month and drive Britain out of the war in six months, which they said would be well before the United States could defend itself 
by adding uh, uh, its uh, forces to the Europeans. The Germans made a peace offering, but the Allies didn't accept it. They refused to talk about it. Woodrow Wilson wanted to be the moderator, and he was the guy who had run for election in 1916 and won on the basis of the slogan, he kept us out of war. Uh, it, it will soon prove to be something that um, he will have to live down. On the Western Front, now, the uh, French commander in, uh, in that was uh, changed. He was appointed, his name was Robert Neville, and he was willing and wanting to uh, win the war. And he was good at convincing the politicians, but he was less capable in the military line. Uh, the Germans decided they ought to retreat back to their defensive line, the Hindenburg line, prepared on ter territory that would leave out of the trench warfare. And as a result of this, uh, they were beginning to need American help, and they were beginning to realize that the British were big and French were beginning to realize this was necessary. Uh, British and the Canadians attacked at a place called Vimy, and they went on a huge offensive, and the French were exhausted, and they had taken 120,000 men as casualties in that offensive. Uh, they were just worn out. French troops mutinied, mostly in the rear areas, and they broke out uh, where drunkenness became rampant. And by the end of May into June, about half of the army refused to go into the line or turned on their officers. So that was a very, very low point. Uh, if you want to see a film, uh, a pretty good one to watch is uh, Paths of Glory with Adolf Manjou and Kirk Douglas in it. It's a black and white film that's been around a long time, but it's very good. And I think I saw it, not within a year anyway. Anyway, the British had to eliminate the German positions on a, and they, their part of the line was what was called Messines Ridge. And the commander put his uh, Welsh miners to work underground, and they drove 19 tunnels under the German trench lines, and they put uh, high explosives in all of them. They blew up that thing, and uh, they could hear the explosion 70 miles away in Great Britain, and it blew the top of the mountain off, and it was handled far better than it was in the American Civil War when they did a similar thing. And uh, the American Northern troops got wiped out as a result of that. But in this one, the Germans only lost um, the ones that were on that bridge. Uh, this set the stage for the Third Battle of Ypres, spelled Y-P-R-E-S. Uh, the British uh, educated class called it Yip in French, but the rest of the uh, British Tommies called them wipers. <laughs> this is also better known as uh, Passchendaele. <coughs> well, the German troops were in this initial offensive very, very leery about going past the captured foodstuffs, and so the uh, Germans finally realized that they were going to have to uh, keep the blockade on, or deal with the blockade kept on, and uh, it will be kept on after, even after the uh, war's casualties ended. But American started to react to the Germans sinking all sorts of American ships that uh, were uh, trading with uh, the English and shipping 
over all of the uh, goods and stuff the Americans had. When America looked like it might be part of the war, Wilson proclaimed our neutrality, and after the, that asked the American nation to be neutral as well, in fact, as well as in name. And they had to uphold the rights of our sea power against Britain and Germany, each one who wanted to destroy the other's foreign trade. Uh, the Americans soon lived to live with, learned to live with the uh, British regulations. And uh, they privately agreed that uh, a British victory was in their interests because we had a profitable market with all that we could produce. Uh, money talks, you know, in wartime situations. Uh, Wilson tried to get them to abandon the unrestricted submarine warfare they were taking it out on all our ships. And after one ship in March of 1916, uh, Wilson had sent an ultimatum to Germany demanding safety for the passengers and to avoid war, Germany in May made the pledge not to do this any longer, but they had to go back on it. Public opinion was divided here in the States. There was no likelihood America would be able to restrain the British and German Americans hope for neutrality and peace. Anti-militarists and peace societies were organized. Uh, Wilson abandoned his opposition to preparedness in 1916, and he asked Congress to pass several defense measures. Uh, in uh, 1916, they passed the National Defense Act, <coughs> increasing the Army and federalizing the state militias. In August, uh, Congress appropriated money for constructing battleships and Navy fighting vessels. And in September, the U.S. Shipping Board was creating the money to buy and build merchant vessels to be operated on the uh, North Atlantic. Uh, Wilson had to stand for re-election in 1916. Still sounds familiar, doesn't it? And uh, he used that stretch. Uh, he kept us out of war, and he won by an arrow margin in the popular vote and the Electoral College. But uh, the Germans now gamble. They're going to try and starve out Britain to, uh, before the U.S. raised and deployed an army to come to Europe. And the Germans rejected all protests and, and had, since Britain had control of all of the cable lines under the Atlantic Ocean, they could listen to uh, what those messages were, and they intercepted a communication sent by the German foreign minister in Berlin, who was ambassador <coughs> in Mexico. And it read, quote, We intend to begin unrestricted submarine warfare. We shall endeavor to keep the U.S. neutral. In the event of this not succeeding, we'll make Mexico a proposal alliance on the following basis. Make war together, make peace together, generous financial support, and an understanding on our part that Mexico is to recapture the lost territory in Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona. This sort of lit the fire under the American public. And the unrestricted submarine warfare began in February of 1970. We broke relations with Germany, and there were a number of ships that were torpedoed on the Atlantic. And the Allied propaganda efforts in the United States were making some inroads into support for Wilson. So they passed the Mobilization Act in May of 17, Selective Service Act, the introduction of the draft. Uh, there were no volunteer units in the American Army 
in World War I, like there had been in the Civil War and in uh, the Spanish-American War. They created several things. They drafted about four million men. About half of these were shipped overseas into Europe, and a uh, third saw active service there. They created what was called the War Industries Board, and it was headed by a fellow named Bernard Baruch. And I well remember Bernard Baruch from uh, the late 40s as uh, a man of uh, great respect. So he was still around for a long time, and he was to agree to control the manufacture of war material. They created a war shipping board to build more ships. They also included an experiment with building ships made out of concrete. They say they weren't all they were cracked up to be. <laughs> the Railroad Administration assumed control of that, and uh, they managed to sort out the enormous demands for shipping, rail shipping, to uh, move all of this stuff to the ports. The fuel administration exerted its efforts. They controlled fuel, uh, coal, and oil, and increasing their production. They also invented something called daylight saving time to conserve electricity, something which most of the farmers and almost all the cows hate. <laughs> they control public opinion. They uh, supported. Uh, dis suppressing dissent. Uh, they locked up people like obvious socialists. Uh, uh, Eugene Debs is probably my uh, favorite candidate for that. Uh, he had uh, run for the Socialist Party for many elections and they locked him up for the duration. The uh, Committee on Public Information headed by a journalist by the name of George Creel they printed books and rented and wrote editorials and they made motion pictures. They could start to do that now. And some of those motion pictures are really something to see. And they had all sorts of inanities resulted from all of this. Uh, sauerkraut became known as Liberty Cabbage. <laughs> and the Frankfurter became the hot dog. And uh, German sounding names like Mueller became Miller, and uh, the Espionage and Sedition Act put some teeth into any obstruction of the war. Okay, they raised money for this by bond sales, more than by taxes, interestingly enough. Liberty and victory bonds were sold in high pressure campaigns. And there were many poor people who had to borrow money at high interest rates to buy the bonds to prove their loyalty. Uh, tax money increasing, and excise profits tax introduced, excise taxes in all kinds of kinds. The cost of the war amounted to $35 billion, and about $10 billion went to uh, the Allies as war loans. Okay, initially uh, we managed to reduce the sinkings in uh, December of 1917 by the adoption of the convoy system ended, invented by a, a, a British uh, Royal Navy commander. And uh, it proved to be quite effective in grouping ships together for a uh, trip across the Atlantic and adding everyone together under the protection of a more efficiently used destroyer screen against the submarine. And General John Pershing was named to command and the American Expeditionary Force was created. Now you've heard about the um, uh, famous uh, Uh, there he goes. Uh, 
uh, this is Black Jack Pershing, the uh, commander in, in chief. Pershing made his reputation prior to the uh, war by chasing Pancho Villa down in Mexico. Never did catch him, but he chased him. And uh, he was well connected politically. He was married to the daughter of a senator from Wyoming. Unfortunately, Pershing lost his family in a barracks or base housing uh, disaster one night and his whole family, his wife and children burned to death in this. And this was, he didn't react much to that, obviously, but uh, they said he got more silent and more taciturn and grayer at the end of that. But anyway, in 1918, things got worse for the uh, French and the British. Okay, for one thing the British and French wanted to do was to incorporate any American forces into their units to stop the uh, German offensives. And uh, that Pershing and his boss, President Wilson, absolutely refused to do. They wanted to have their own uh, situation. They wanted their own troops. And before I get into that, I need to specify something here about how we study this in the uh, in the ROTC program. I spent 22 years teaching in that. And we produced uh, some 15 officers a year going through this. And, and I tried to ground them a little bit in uh, military history. You know, it always helps to know some of the mistakes that have been made in the past. It, and hopefully you won't make them quite as easily in the future. So we taught this in our uh, uh, course here, uh, we would point out what the German situation was in the Western Front and teaching the so-called principles of war. It's nothing more than a framework for analyzing and breaking down the uh, uh, actions of the past. And as this framework works fairly well, it has been used for uh, quite a number of years. I know when I went to basic, I got this too, and then I ended up inflicting it on all sorts of uh, future students. But um, this is the way we look at things. Uh, the Germans knew that they had to do something. They were in hurt in status. They had to make up for all of the lost uh, forces that they had lost and the initiative that they made and so Field Marshal Paul von Hindenburg and he, he was a great uh, great looking commander and leader but he wasn't terribly smart but he won his reputation in 1871 war and he had a guy in the name of Eric Ludendorff who was his brains and uh, between the two of them they thought that only offensive action would gain a decision and attrition hadn't paid off and so now they're going to have to do something else. The, uh, the British had uh, lost a great deal of manpower as well as uh, what the French had as well. Well, we need to start out by looking at what's called the Houtier Tactics. It was developed by a German officer in the name of Oscar von Houtier, and he uh, came up with these uh, principles to uh, better win the war. Surprise, uh, using short bombardments. Don't use a week worth of bombardment when you could use one, one night's worth. And uh, that's what uh, helped by finding the weak points in the 
and then bypassing formidable defenses using maneuver and exploiting deep. In other words, when they made a penetration, they should attack us straight ahead and widen out the shoulders of their penetration so that the follow-on troops can come and make better exploitation. And deep as possible and try and be as numerically superior before you actually start using maximum fire support and maintaining momentum. If you're familiar with, and I doubt it, many people here are familiar with modern uh, tactical warfare that's taught in our academies, these are basically things that are start, used today in uh, American tactics. And we then, the Germans began to use the, what was called the big push. And the Germans pushed into the line this far in a huge penetration starting out in, uh, in March and gaining their initial offensives. And uh, this shows the situation through the uh, 10th of July of 1918. So we've got an, another one here. Uh, Pershing got us assigned to this particular area, including this thing here, which is called the San Miguel Salient. It's called a salient because it's a prominent feature pushed into a defensive line. And the American troops got there just in time so that uh, they could get into the uh, stopping of the German offensive. But the only problem was that uh, the, the British and the French weren't all that happy to have Americans operating as a unified command. They, had, they wanted to fill right into their ranks to help stop the Germans. Well, Pershing refusing to do this, it ended up where they were assigned a temporary sector here to help stop the German push on these lines. But we then had to uh, move our forces together into our own sector, which we took up into this area right here. And that would be our operating area. And our first employment there was at a place called Cantonay. Uh, get my fat fingers on the right hole plug here. And uh, these are the uh, later uh, penetrations. The Second Battle of the Marne starting in uh, in uh, July and into August, saw the American forces taking action to to uh, stop the British or stop the Germans' advances into the British and French lines, and then turn them around to get back into the uh, territory that they had lost. And I, you know, I'm being told I got five minutes yet to uh, finish this off, and I think I can probably do that. And this is the diagram of the uh, next big operation, the one that uh, American forces got to participate in, and. We exploited uh, our advances, even though we did. It was uh, going to be a long year ahead. Okay, uh, why don't we go ahead and take our break right now? So it's maybe five minutes early, but uh, that's all right. We compensate on that because I'm at a good stopping point here. We'll take a 10 minute break. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
Oh, we go. Oh, we, I'm, I'm rolling. Okay. <laughs> oh, you ready? Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll get back started again. The uh, map up here is uh, mentioning Cantonay again. Uh, the reason why I, uh, I bring this up is that uh, I spent all my time in the Army and the Air Force, not in the Marine Corps. But the Marines have uh, quite a reputation, and they never hesitate to remind people of that. And <laughs> they uh, were a part of the 2nd Infantry Division, or Indian Head Division, that you recognize by their shoulder patch. Uh, Indian Head Division is still in it. Um, in operation, uh, they're stationed in Korea. But this one brigade of Marines checked the advancing Germans at this uh, place called Bellu Wood. And then, as soon as they were operational, they turned them around, and uh, that was the beginning of our first offensive test. And the Marines were quite successful in that. Uh, largely because uh, in the, they had more practice in the years after the Spanish-American War. The Americans dominated the Caribbean and took action against a good many of the incipient rebellions that were going on in, the, in that area. And so they'd had a lot of practice. And so they've always managed to uh, outbreak the uh, army in uh, in their exploits. But anyway, the Allies began to mount their, uh, uh, their uh, counteroffensive uh, in August of uh, the, the British and the French and some Americans with tank had used them to uh, push the Germans back. And eventually, the uh, German high command eventually had to renew their uh, suit for peace. Um, Ludendorff and Hindenburg had spent what reserves they had in their swings in the spring and summer of 1918. Those uh, tactics that they were using had um, helped con considerably, but uh, they eventually had to give up. And the next day, came up with the uh, two offensives in which the Americans uh, were able to participate. The Germans had held these uh, territories for quite some time, and we were concentrated west of the city of Verdun, and they managed to uh, seize the Argon Forest and uh, unhinge the Hindenburg Line. They almost got as far as uh, Sudan. And by September, they had pretty much accomplished their objectives. But the biggest part of uh, Pershing's plan was to pinch off that salient which had been stuck into the lines for uh, quite some time, several years as a matter of fact. And the Americans acquitted themselves uh, very well in this particular uh, battle. And from that point on, the Germans were ready to sue for peace. You can see all of these um, arrows maneuvering. You can see the the way military maps are, are drawn. Uh, you almost have to uh, have inside knowledge as to how these things work. The uh, numbers in here indicate particular divisions of uh, troops. <coughs> And you can see on the uh, 
offensive. The, the plan was to uh, pinch off this whole area that had the Germans held for quite some time. Well, it's not long before they realize uh, they're going to have to have some form of uh, peace initiatives. And these are the final initiatives, final actions up through November. Okay, now here's where we get into the diplomatic part of it. Wilson's vote to Congress, uh, he had communicated these 14 points and uh, they show what Wilson thought had caused the war and had gotten the United States into it. And here was his solutions as to what was wrong in Europe. And you can see these as we go through them here. Of the abolition of secret diplomacy. Well, very difficult to have diplomatic negotiations in secret. Excuse me, in open secrets, where secrets are not kept. And so, it's one of those things where, oh, come on. <laughs> if I can't get this thing back again. Again, I gotta keep my fat fingers off this uh, thing. Anyway, uh, freedom of the seas and peace of war has always been a political objective of both Great Britain and the United States. And uh, Wilson uh, thought that if we would eliminate tariff barriers, uh, it would open up free and uh, encourage trade between countries which would normally reduce tensions. Um, we're, I, I guess we're now back into a reinstitution of, of tariff barriers. But if the countries involved in them would reduce their armaments mutually, there would be less chance of some kind of a, uh, of a conflict breaking out accidentally. Uh, if uh, if things were in in these uh, colonial disputes, if they could be resolved peacefully, Wilson thought that there would be less chance of countries going to war. They also wished that uh, he also wanted and to evacuate Russia and break and the empire was already destroyed. The Tsar and his whole family up to 1917 were massacred. And the provisional government had barely control over the territories that Russia owned. Uh, his point on evacuation and restore, restoration of Belgium it was going back to a treaty that had been signed in the early part of the 19th century that Britain would uh, defend uh, Belgium as an, as an independent state. He continues on wanting them to restore France, including Alsace and Lorraine. Alsace and Lorraine were two uh, provinces on the eastern edge of France that the Germans had seized in the uh, war in 1871. And seeking adjustment of the borders of Italy because there were numerous peoples 
who were demanding their own autonomy. And that included all the peoples that were under the Austria-Hungarian Empire, which was quite large, including the Balkan states and self-determination for non-Turkish people. Uh, I don't think they thought much about the Muslim or Turkish people. Also, internationalization of the straits. These are the straits that communicate from the Aegean Sea into the Black Sea that were regarded as being extremely vital for uh, trade. They wish to reconstruct Poland, in fact, to make Poland an independent country, and it becomes an independent country with an access to the sea. And Poland had been part of the Russian Empire uh, throughout the 19th century. And the creation of a general association of nations. This was called the, the League of Nations which is the forerunner of the uh, United Nations today. And Wilson regarded this as being the foremost uh, thing that they had to do in order to keep peace in the world and avoid the next conflict. Well, things don't work out quite that well in the 1920s and 30s. The end of the road comes on the 4th of October begins, uh, the new chancellor has been given the power to make peace. And they accept the 14 points that we've just been through. Uh, Ludendorff, the chief of staff, resigns and he's exiled. He lives the rest of his life in uh, Sweden, I think. And the high sea floor fleet was ordered to uh, sortie, but they refused. The sailors quit. They laid down their arms, and the German fleet would not break out into the Atlantic. And then finally, the Americans began to break through at uh, Sudan, and the revolutionary disorders take effect. And during this time, uh, the German acting premier meets with uh, Marshal Foch, the French generalissimo, the chief, and then Hindenburg confronts the Kaiser, and the Kaiser abdicates. He was very resistant to this, um, but he, the German government proclaimed the Weimar Republic. Now, Weimar is a city in in Germany, and it became known as the uh, seat of government. On the 10th, the Kaiser goes into exile. He goes into Holland, where he lives uh, the rest of his life, dying, I think, in 1942. And on the 11th of November, the armistice is signed, and it goes into effect in that uh, symbolic date. And that was the end of World War I. That wasn't the end of American involvement in it. And we'll, if I can get this thing to quit on me. <laughs> it's resistant. It's the first time we've operated a Mac in this new configuration with our projectors. But anyway, I'm ready to answer questions now. And uh, we're really, we can get started on that. Okay. I went through this very rapidly because I figured we had to have uh, some form of uh, question and answer session at the end. Yeah. 
It seems like our troops were not involved um, that much, but a lot of lives were lost. Do you know how many lives, American lives, were lost during the First World War? Yes, there were quite a, quite a large number of uh, American lives. In terms of uh, casualties, uh, in the first ba first battles, there were about 8,300 people in casualties. And uh, <clears throat> Canton A, which was the first infantry of uh, attacks that the Americans participated in, there were some 941 casualties. Then in uh, Soissons, the 1st and 2nd Divisions in July endured about 12,200. So the Americans suffered casualties like everybody else did. They had huge amounts of uh, people. Yeah, okay. Jean? Could you define what a casualty is? Okay, the casualties uh, you hear uh, defined as people who are wounded, killed, or put out of action in some way. That's totally a casualty. Then there's dead, wounded, and incapacitated in that. Uh, Monty, let's see. Lonnie Redinas, uh, as I recall, if my history is right, the, the League of Nations was formed, but the United States never joined it. That's right. Why, why didn't we join it, you know? Well, I think uh, some of it had to do with politics. <laughs> <laughs> we seem to encounter that uh, periodically, but... Uh, Woodrow Wilson did not include anybody from the opposition party. He was a Democrat. He uh, did not include anybody who was a uh, Republican on his uh, delegation when they went to uh, the negotiations in Paris starting the 1st of January of 1919. So Wilson, I think, brought on uh, through this snubbing of the Republican Party a chance to uh, get this treaty adopted. The treaty was never adopted, ratified by Congress after it was signed. It went into effect with basically the United States not participating in it. And that's the reason, I think, why the League of Nations was uh, headquartered in Geneva it was, I'm pretty sure it was Geneva, and uh, it, it was never able to uh, be effective. Uh, we tried to, uh, in, at the end of World War II, to do it differently. That's why the United States was one of the big backers of creating the, the, the United Nations. Okay. Uh, Jim, uh, Judy Hunter here. Jim, outside of the League of Nations, could you talk a little about what effects, good or bad, the uh, Wilson's 14 points had? Were there, did it have effect and what were they? Actually, they, there was not much effect that the 14 points actually did. Not much good anyway. Uh, because some of these were were useful. In, uh, in the, the point about reduced armaments consistent with national security, uh, that is pretty much a dream unless everybody is bought into the uh, concept of uh, reducing armaments and then verifying that these armaments have been reduced so that surprise attacks cannot take place. Uh, impartial adjustment of colonial claims, 
that it was very difficult to do because of all of the uh, nations of, the, of Europe, mostly. The, they had colonies in various parts of the world, but they were exploiting for uh, uh, mercantile gain. And they weren't anxious to give up these things because there was money involved in them. Uh, uh, people's self-determination was another big uh, one there that uh, they fought over because not all peoples were considered by the European powers as being worthy of having their own self-determined government and relations with others. Uh, restoration of uh, Belgium would, was something that was accomplished right away. And that uh, the Germans pulled back into uh, Germany, there were uh, enclaves that the United States maintained troops and they were in Europe for a uh, couple of years anyway, before we brought all our troops home in the 1920s. Uh, the assessment of Italian frontiers and the self-determination of nationalities in uh, Austria-Hungary and the Balkans was to be a thorn in the side of uh, European relations for years to come. Because all these different peoples, the uh, Montenegrins, the Slovenes, the Slovaks, the et cetera, et cetera, they all wanted their own self-determination. And that was not always possible. They, none of the, many of these were not viable combinations. And so it remained as a thing. Uh, Yugoslavia, for example, was uh, one of the main things where so many of these different peoples were unable to be accommodated in their own national aspirations. And it led to a very unstable situation. And that's one of the reasons why um, people talked about uh, negotiations taking place in there. It was, uh, about as bitter as a Balkan cabinet meeting, and so it was. It was not a uh, a good position to be in to have to deal with these. The Germans, of course, had rejected all of these <coughs> terms, um, but they finally had were forced to do it. They had to accept it, and so the Weimar Republic became the means of governing Germany, and it will be until 1917, uh, 1937-38 in that time of the frame. Uh, Adolf Hitler was a corporal in the German army and uh, acquitted himself very bravely in the trench warfare, being wounded and awarded the Iron Cross. He was uh, the big, big man on uh, telling people that uh, the Germans had been sold out, stabbed in the back by the people in government and the Allies as well as the uh, people in Germany. And they sold, he sold the whole German people a whole bunch of goods about how they had been uh, had taken advantage of in the 1920s and 30s when they tried to implement this uh, peace agreement. And having used that as his main thing, he got to be a uh, leading politician in Germany in the 1930s. Uh, yes, sir. Who wants to be evacuated from Russia? Wait a minute. <laughs> Who would be evacuated from Russia? My name is Steve. The question is, who was to be evacuated from Russia on that list of things there? Oh, on that, uh, 
Russia had uh, had had a good deal of territory that was signed over after the Russian Revolution and the peace treaty that the Germans had forced on the Russians on Lenin and and the provisional government. The uh, Germans would occupy a big chunk of territory in the east, be the western part of Russia or the Soviet Union, as it later became. The uh, German army had to be evacuated from that and brought back to uh, Germany. There were some allied peoples in there. There were a, a very large number of Czechs that had been captured and shipped into uh, Russia. And they formed a, a military unit of their own and they got evacuated by their own efforts and they headed across Siberia all the way to Vladivostok uh, by trains on the Trans-Siberian Railroad. And uh, they were then transported back to Europe by ships the Allies had rented to uh, repatriate these uh, brave Czechs. And so they were basically looking after themselves, getting out of the uh, Soviet Union. Shane Estes. Jim, um, could you talk to us a little bit about the relationship uh, between Winston Churchill and particularly Wilson and, and the influence that that might have had on the entrance of the United States into World War I. And then also I'd like to hear you talk a little bit about the later effects of reparations and how that uh, set up a whole conflictive situation between Germany and particularly France. Okay, well, part of that, uh, let me take that reparations thing first. The uh, part of uh, the treaty involved the uh, demand for Germany to pay for what the Allies had lost in that war. Uh, a humongous number, a major number of, uh, of uh, value dollars or pounds or whatever currency you wanted to use in that. And it would bankrupt the Germans, basically if they came through with all of this, uh, it, it simply proved to be impossible for the Germans to cough up this kind of resource. Although some of it was taken by the French, in particular, from Germany and the, uh, as they occupied part of the Saar and the uh, Rhineland territories. Americans had a zone of occupation, too, in the Rhineland area, but uh, Wilson and Wilson's successor uh, already brought back most of the, Ger the American troops out of Germany as soon as they could. Now, as uh, far as relationships between uh, Churchill and uh, and Wilson, I don't think there was much of any relation. I think Churchill does not gain his uh, political power until well into the 1930s. Uh, he was also he was quite active in Parliament, and he was uh, a uh, man in charge of production of munitions for the uh, British. And uh, he was mostly in uh, the logistics end of it, uh, not in the political end of it, even though he was a cabinet member during World War I. Churchill's wars came prior to that time in the Boer War and uh, the African War of the Empire. Okay, any other? Yeah, Tommy? <laughs> Uh, Tommy Haas. Um, I, I can't, I'm trying to remember, Jim, whether or not, it, it sticks in my mind, 
um, maybe when I went to the Hoover, you know, in West Branch, um, that Hoover and his wife were, that the Len Lease program was actually instituted after World War I, which is one of the reasons why Truman then got Hoover involved after World War II, because in terms of, I, I'm just trying to, you know, remember Hoover, that. Hoover was a big man on campus when it came to producing food here in the United States. And that was his one area in which he, uh, he did most of his service. And this was during the World War I period. Uh, but uh, after that, uh, Hoover was uh, in, still in politics, but uh, it will be uh, some, some time before he actually gets into power. Yeah. Nancy? <coughs> I had a great uncle who was killed in World War I, and when you said that all of our servicemen were drafted during that period, there were no volunteers, I was wondering if the casualty count in part was um, because these soldiers received no training or, or what the situations were in the trenches for them. Well, the United States had to learn how to employ their forces. They had to actually, the individual units and the individuals within those units gain experience. And I must say it's a hard way that most soldiers end up gaining their experience. They're trained to operate the weaponry and uh, the equipment that they're using and so on and so forth. But in military operations, experience counts for a great deal. And uh, they have to learn the business on the fly, basically. And so even though you, they're trained according to doctrine and how to operate the equipment and the machinery and the weaponry, they still got to practice it. And that's easier said than done sometimes. Sir? Stephen Tees, in relation to the this time frame, my understanding the Austro-Hungarian Empire was a lot bigger than Germany was. How was it Germany ended up being the dominant player in that in that agreement? Uh, the Germans were essentially wiped out as far as a, a power in Europe goes into the. 1930s when they came back again because the Allies had claimed all manner of reparations and had drained a tremendous amount of money and material out of Germany as reparations and payment back for having been in the war and having started the war. See, when the Germans started the war, they had to, according to their plans, if they were in war against France, they had to invade through Belgium into France. And that, of course, violates whatever we think of as being the relations between nations. And so they had to take the blame for that. I'm afraid that uh, the Germans felt, with maybe some justification, that they had gotten the shaft in that. Uh, peace treaty. It was the victor's peace treaty. Well, if there are no further ones, I, I'll sign off here now. This will be my last one. And we thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>